Welcome. Uh, for those of you just coming in, come on in, grab some food, get a seat. Uh, I'm Dr. Larry Chu. I am an associate professor of anesthesia at Stanford. I am executive director of Medicine X. So happy to uh, welcome you here to the launch event for uh, MedX Makers, which is our new initiative here at Medicine X. Uh, in an attempt to join two worlds together. The maker community of uh, passionate individuals who are seeking to create solutions to problems and the MedEx community. Uh, our community here, not only at Stanford, but our MedEx community around the world of patients, uh, healthcare providers, uh, those of us working in healthcare and seeing all the problems that exist. So um, that is what MedEx Makers is. It's a combination uh, of those two worlds, and um, also Medicine X. And for those of you who don't know who we are, we are a program here at Stanford that aims to explore the intersection of emerging technology and medicine. Uh, we are a year-long program. We're doing more than just our world-leading conference that we have once a year at the end of September. But we actually are a year-round program, and we have events, <coughs> classes, and um, projects year-round. And Medicine X. MedEx Makers is one of them. So thank you for joining us tonight for our launch event. Um, just a couple things to let you know. We are live streaming this, so anyone behind the third row, you're not on camera. Just You're not on camera. But if you come in front of the third row, you will be on camera. So say hi to the internet if you are up here. And we do this because we want to break down some of the silos in academia and open up events like this to anyone and everyone, even those who can't be here. So we thank you very much. So um, we will uh, be. Rec this is being live streamed. It will be archived and available for playing online afterwards. And the other thing we do at Medicine X is we actually take questions from Twitter, so that people who want to ask questions and are following this on Twitter can can do so. So while I have you on the subject of social media, I see lots of smartphones. And here at Medicine X, we welcome them. We want you to take them out, uh, use them. Uh, MedX, hashtag MedX. That is the hashtag for tonight. Please direct your comments up there. Also, here's a list of all the Twitter IDs of tonight's speakers, including our special guest, the real Zoe Chu, the third row. Our, ma our Medicine X mascot. So she's also here. We'll have to get her from the camera because Kurt sings on Twitter always asks about Zoe. We'll bring her up in a second. Um, so when you are sharing your ideas on Twitter, you're helping people who can't be here be part of the event. So uh, we really do encourage you to engage, share your ideas. Uh, also, those connections can be maintained after tonight's event is over. A couple more announcements. We have, can I get a demo, Monique? Can you demo the water bottle? We're launching our new Medicine X water bottles. And these are prizes we're going to give out tonight. And so what we want you guys to do, uh, at some point tonight, <coughs> share your impressions of tonight's event with us on our Meetup page. Let us know what do you want to hear about at our next MedX Maker event. And tell us how we can make things better. So we're going to be monitoring that Meetup page. And uh, send us some really great feedback and comments. And how many did we say? Ten? Something like ten? So we'll, we'll pick ten people who give us good comments to get a water bottle tonight. And anybody who asks a question tonight will also get a water bottle. <laughs> so um, the way tonight's going to work uh, is um, actually I'm going to bring Monica up right now. Monica, come up here. Monica Wittig, she is the, uh, co uh, the founder of Land Live Architecture, which is the architecture design consultancy based in Colorado. She is also the co-lead, my partner in crime for MedX Makers. <laughs> um, we, I, we met at MedX. We did. And, uh, and I'm so proud to be working with Monica. Um, she, she really is so knowledgeable in this area. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to handle the microphone to Monica and um, let her run the show this evening. Thank you. So maybe to start there with my lineage of architecture and just mention very quickly of how I came to find a home here. And a lot of the topics that we'll talk about tonight have to do with customization and, 
information management, all of these things that I studied when I studied uh, digital architecture production. And then I came to the realization in the architectural world it was a lot about squares and rectangles and paint colors and things like that. So what I want to say is I found a home with these topics here. And I hope all of you will look at tonight as a kind of kickoff of where we're building a home. And this home is not about me. It's about everyone here tonight. And we're just laying those first foundation. Um, and we don't know what that house looks like yet. So as Dr. Chu mentioned, we welcome your feedback. Uh, we're, we're lots of windows and doors in this home, and we invite you in. So also look around the room. There are some really incredible people that are here from a vast range of backgrounds. And let's start with our presenters to hear a little bit more about them. So our first presentation will be by Athor Bender. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed through a bit of these bios, so forgive me for that. He's the co-founder and CEO of Unique, a company using 3D printing to bring personalization and fashion to the prosthetic and orthotic industry. Prior, he was the CEO of Exo Bionics, where he and his team unveiled wearable robotic Exo, which enables wheelchair users to stand and walk. Maybe I should repeat that. <laughs> which enables wheelchair users to stand, which enables wheelchair users to stand and walk with this Exo Bionic skeleton. He's taken several companies from an R&D lab to nimble commercial and publicly traded enterprises, including. Pardon, I'm running into the name. I, uh, Icelandic designer of non-invasive lower limb bionic technologies. And he's currently a faculty member at Sing Singularity University. So I welcome Athor Bender. Technologies and then, uh, like I said, the uh, EXO, uh, which we took on stage uh, at the TED in 2011. And so uh, it's been a fun, fun journey. And uh, but now I want to talk a little bit about where I feel like we have uh, left things out uh, in this, uh, uh, where we have been enjoying this uh, ride of uh, uh, amazing feedback from customers as well as. Uh, technology coming our way. Um, we have, uh, this is typically what we deal with, amputees, uh, helping them to walk, uh, paralyzed people with scoliosis, injuries, uh, and osteoarthritis. Uh, those are the things that we are try trying to help with. And uh, we're focusing right now on prosthetics, uh, and that's kind of what I want to focus most of the presentation on. Uh, if you look at prosthetics, how the evolution has been, You've gone from um, uh, very primitive devices over to something that uh, is much more uh, advanced, uh, certainly. Uh, this is uh, some of the upper extremity prosthetics from the past, as you can see here. And, uh, <clears throat> and here's some other interesting uh, pictures, or in many ways, very beautiful. Uh, and uh, they're also obviously very primitive. In the World War II, uh, we had to optimize things. We had a lot of amputees. So we had to uh, create more modular systems, and things became kind of a little bit more industrial. And then in the last, uh, I would say, uh, 20, 20 years or so, we have been working a lot of interesting materials, uh, carbon fiber, silicon, and so on, to make these devices more effective and comfortable. Uh, in the last 10 years, 
is kind of the bionic era, uh, the rise of the bionic man again. And uh, we uh, <coughs> introduced sensors, motors, batteries, and other things uh, into the prosthetic limbs that obviously has taken it even to a higher level and higher prices. Um, <coughs> but it's interesting that in this whole uh, journey that we've been on, we kind of left a little bit out uh, uh, something that's so obvious to us. I see most of you sitting here with an actual computer, and uh, somehow the design element has got uh, somehow lost in this uh, technology uh, uh, on steroids kind of era that we've been on in the last uh, 10 years. Um, if you look at how prosthetics are made nowadays, it is actually very primitive. I mean, usually prosthetists are uh, highly educated individuals. Uh, with uh, master degrees from universities around the world, and this is what they have to deal with uh, when it comes to the prosthetic uh, finishing. And uh, it's fairly, like I said, uh, something that has somehow got lost in the shuffle. This is amazing because if we look at and we talk to amputees, most of them say that the body image obviously is very important for them. And uh, there are studies that show that uh, body image and so on uh, for them, just makes it harder for them to get out of bed and up and walking again. It's hard enough, right? And then, uh, <clears throat> at the same time, we also hear that uh, they are not happy with current solutions. So most of them are not happy or neutral about the appearance of their prosthetic limb. So <clears throat> we thought that especially, and we started then reaching out further and talking to amputees directly, Ourself, I mean, typical response was like from this one here. You know, when you shop for prosthetics, as you kind of go to your guy who puts it together and you tell them what you're looking for, and they find a leg for a prosthetic that works, there's no input. So there is very little input. Uh, people have not much of a choice. But it's just amazing if you look into other medical into or into other medical devices that we wear on our body, uh, like glasses. Uh, Warby and Parker is, for instance, a company that has taken that to a different level. Uh, prescription eyewear that you can online uh, order, and uh, they're using all kind of retail uh, tricks to kind of make it more comfortable and pleasant experience for people uh, to go through. Even hearing devices, which, by the way, today are 95% 3D printed, uh, have uh, gone down this road as well. And uh, <coughs> so it's interesting that just out of uh, Bay Area, about four or five years ago, a company emerged called Bespoke Innovations that uh, had a different idea about this. And uh, it was a designer, Scott Summit, and, uh, and he, he really, um, I would say, is the pioneer in terms of introducing new elements into this, and this is the 3D printing. I wonder what would happen if an industrial designer had to go at making prosthetic legs, things that are beautiful but don't try to look man-made, but that also don't neglect the aesthetics. So Scott, uh, the background from Apple, uh, had a little bit different uh, industrial designer had a little bit different vision about this. And um, this woman, Deborah, she had lost her leg in a motorcycle crash. And we created this fairing for her, and the whole idea was just how beautiful can we make it. Polished metal, three-dimensionally printed, lace-like pattern, uh, really capturing the, the really beautiful calves that she had. And all of a sudden, she started sending me texts about people who would stop her in the grocery store and tell her what the she had. And she was wearing skirts that she hadn't worn to opera. Symphony out in public so that she could actually show what, what she had. We were working with Chad, who was another guy, who uh, lost his leg to cancer. And we, we created this cool leg for him, one for playing soccer, he's a competitive soccer player. We created another just for wearing around town. And when we put it on him, I think two and a half, maybe three years ago, something, he reached down and felt this leg and he kind of paused and he said, Wow, I, I haven't felt that shape in eight years. And that was this amazing thing because it wasn't just that we're creating something that looks cool we're recreating a sense of self. And I think there's this huge opportunity to turn those into not just something that is a engineering artifact that happens to surround the body and augment functionality, but 
really creates something that connects to the person, not just in that tactile, physical way, but emotionally. It, it kind of changed these people's lives and changed the way they uh, got to do every day. So this was a completely new thinking. Unfortunately, uh, Bespoke never managed to get the prices down uh, far enough to make it really affordable for reimbursement system. So it really never took off as a, as a product. And I was personally very frustrated about that. I was a good friend of, of Scott and, uh, and spent a lot of time with him trying to kind of uh, give him advice on, on, on this. And the company was all 3D systems. Um, and he's still there. But uh, then uh, Unique Immersed as an idea that actually came out of Spain. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, Manuel Bosa, and, uh, who is an engineer, but an amputee as well, had worked with me before, came to me and said that he had good ideas about how to do this and showed me some interesting things. And suddenly I saw that here we can combine the dots a little bit between what Scott is doing and uh, they down in Spain. And so basically in terms of creating something that goes, I call it going from sticks uh, to, to, to style. And uh, <clears throat> so we introduced a company called Unica one year ago, and uh, we were able to create uh, there with uh, much cheaper printers, actually FTM printers, uh, these type of fairings that uh, are much more affordable and reimbursable. And uh, we've also tried to create a little bit different experience for amputees at the same time. So allow them to buy this through online ordering as well. Personally, they can actually do it in their own homes, the whole process. Or uh, this is this process here, select, snap, and shine. <laughs> Typically, nobody has actually sold anything direct to amputees before. So this was an experiment in itself as well, which 3D printing gives you. And, uh, and uh, choice. Uh, this is something that you heard from Travis here earlier, just amputees just didn't have. They can look at different uh, products, different prices, and select. And, uh, and so, <coughs> additionally, we obviously had to cooperate with clinics because that is important, because clinics who fit prosthetic legs, they make reimbursement possible. So if you want to get reimbursed, you need to go to clinics, and that's why we think the uh, we, we, we start to create collateral for these clinics, more like a little bit like the fashion industry, so experimenting with that element. Uh, all new things that have, has not been seen uh, for five million people, pretty much, and uh, around the world. And the way we do it, we, we take pretty much just photos, uh, we use uh, one to three D cuts uh, from Autodesk to load this up into, into the uh, and create mass uh, files or, or pictures that uh, allow us to uh, then, then, then print it. Eight photos, seven measurements. So it's a fairly simple process. And um, just make it as, as simple as, 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 as any way possible, both for the clinician as well as for the users. And we use FTM printers uh, from Europe to do this. And uh, the process is, today is about uh, eight uh, weeks from the time they order till we deliver, and this summer we'll probably get it down <coughs> to about uh, three to four weeks. This is our printing farm here. Uh, we have about 20 printers, and uh, then we can paint it, we can hydro paint it, um, and, and so on. So, so this is this is pretty much the the, the process. I'm fast forwarding here, and then and shine, right? And. Uh, a lot of happy moments. <laughs> and you see even amputees taking pictures of themselves in front of Christmas tree and so on, something that you never saw with, with legs before. I mean, being very proud. And this has been, like we said, one year. A uh, lot of users already walking, even in fashion shows, like uh, in New York Fashion Week last year, unheard of, first amputee ever. And, uh, and also, just tonight, uh, at the San Francisco Wearable Fashion Week, we are actually there as well. We are invited with a short notice. So uh, this is a new era, and very exciting to be a, somehow part of. And, uh, and people express it in all kind of ways. <coughs> they want to look like the Iron Man. This guy wanted to be like his Hummer car, uh, <laughs> same color. <laughs> and uh, people who just didn't imagine using a fairing before, cannot uh, leave behind now. 
and, and so on and so on. So uh, I'm going to skip through this video. It's uh, the first time I walked. Uh, go to this one here, which is interesting because this is actually Deborah, who uh, Scott actually talked about earlier. She actually got her bearing from us just recently. Not having another calf and trying to wear like skinny jeans or knee-high boots or anything where you're gonna see that shape is really difficult. So in order to pull that off because I want to wear those things, I um, made my own sort of foam duct tape leg that fills in the shape so that I can wear my boots because otherwise the boots just fall down. I first saw Unique through a lot of my athlete friends. And then I saw somebody wearing a unique cover and I immediately ran up to them and asked them a million questions. And as soon as I got home, I got on um, the internet and just started live chatting with somebody from Unique. After I decided which cover I wanted, um, I realized that I could go through insurance to have them cover a portion of it and use my flexible spending account. And it, that was a surprise to me. I didn't know that that was even an option. <laughs> I like pretty things. I'm an artist. I love to be surrounded by beautiful things. I like to look at beauty, enjoy beauty. It's really, it's just an important thing to me. I like things to be aesthetically pleasing. You know, in my room, my car, my job, everything that I surround myself with. I, I just like to look at pretty things. And so I want to be pretty, and I want my leg to be pretty. And she is actually, by the, one, by the way, the one who is working on Fashion Week tonight. <laughs> so I was very excited about that. Um, so like I said, uh, this is reimbursed. We managed to get the prices down uh, through process optimization. Next step is really um, that we worked with 3D systems in the past quite a bit on these exoskeletons, and uh, we are Teaming up again, uh, 3D Systems and Unique, uh, we have a partnership now in terms of bringing to market, um, again, their fairings, much more cheaper now, uh, using our process uh, with SLS printers and uh, scoliosis braces. Uh, that will be our next uh, area. Um, going from looking something like this to looking something like that. And uh, so we are. Uh, doing a preliminary launch of these braces now in in France next week, no, next month. And um, in terms of the future, just very quickly, where I see things going is that we go from typical clinics probably in the future, uh, in, in the past, over to being able to just take photos, take uh, scans in a very effective way, even in pharmacies, in retail settings, and uh, capture that the image is that way we do this. Hello, I am Moshbot, the orchard and store robot, robot helper. What are you looking for? Robots can help a lot there. And uh, and robots even can, could help a lot in terms of, I think, even interacting with people. And we see many examples of that. I'm not going to play this video, but it's a good, um, we, we, there are many, many good examples of uh, use of robots and telepresence. Uh, to bring this experience closer to people. And then also uh, the printers will more and more print the whole leg. Uh, I think that is pretty obvious. And uh, even people willing to give up some function for having just on a regular basis new legs. And um, <clears throat> we can do it cheaper with 3D printers. And, uh, <clears throat> and we are basically just dematerializing, just like we did with these type of devices into one little kind of uh, iPod uh, we gave up maybe some quality of music, but, uh, uh, sure. but I think I'm jumping here through a couple of things because I know that I'm out of time. Um, but then finally, what I'm very, very excited about is giving printers out more and more into the environment where people can just print these things uh, in their homes uh, or even uh, or in clinics, so that we avoid the uh, shipping cost. We can bring design and uh, just the whole experience was closer to the consumers. And that's something that uh, is definitely going to happen in the near future with, with 3D printers becoming, as we know from HP and that TED talk that was here on Carbon 3D, 
much, much faster and easier to work with. So that's it. Sorry, I went a little bit over time. <laughs> Thank you, Ether. So next we have Michael Balsa. He's the founder of Slow 3D Creators. It's a 3D scan, print, and design and education studio based in San Luis Obispo. He, he works there with students, artisans, engineers, architects, manufacturers, and innovators to take their ideas to the next level. He's also the producer of one of the very first podcasts it's also now on YouTube channel on 3D technology with interviews, roundtable <coughs> discussions, and weekly news shows. It's called All Things 3D. And lastly, I want to mention he's working with Shriners Children's Hospital, the Burn Center in Sacramento, to provide them with a no cost, a complete HD 3D scanning system based upon structure sensor and his proprietary four eyes lens. Welcome, Michael. Can everyone hear me? How's my sound level there? You can tell that I produce a show as well. So my wife was planning to be here with me, but sadly she can't. But the nice thing about 3D printing is I can always keep a little one of her. <laughs> <laughs> so she's always with me. And she's actually watching. Hi, honey. So on that note, um, as she mentioned, I have a little 3D thing. I've always been interested in 3D. I'd say for the last 30 years of my life. So. Tells you how old I am. But uh, on that note, I kind of went from 3D visualization into tangible objects, and some of them here you can see, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. And then I also thought I wanted to do a podcast, I wanted to talk about 3D with other people. So, about the last year and a half, my friend uh, Chris Kopeck, who runs also a 3D print shop in uh, Paso Robles, uh, which is just up the road from me decided to do this podcast and we've been doing it about a year and a half and we've been talking to people around the world about 3D printing, 3D design, 3D scanning. Uh, my son just joined me. He's going to be talking about 3D and engineering in the next uh, upcoming podcast which starts tomorrow. Plus we'll be at Maker talking about it. Well that's not the reason that I'm here today. If some of you have been following the news and my only reason for putting it out there initially was I was doing a 3D in medicine seminar in my local town, so I thought, well, maybe I'll just go to 3Dears.org or some of these other locations. And they took what I wrote there and immediately put it on, on the web. So the next thing you know, the Chinese are interpreting it and everybody else. It kind of became a flurry. And uh, since then, I've had a couple of interviews on this process. And this is, I guess, the maker part of it. And I thought I'd do a little special thing here. God, that was too quick. I had the little guy go across. But, uh, so one of the things that I want to go through, I don't know what your background is, but kind of go through the different processes of actually creating these tangible models here. And there's a wide variety of techniques that can be used. But before we do that, uh, essentially you have to use a scanner in order to derive the information to print it. So in the fabrication process, process there's man-made structural materials that will go over the organic and biomaterials. And I just put in BioBot because we actually have one we can really touch and not have to actually go to a university. So I think that's really cool from Danny. And then pharmaceuticals. So into the scanning process, common types are light-based emission reception, kind of like my little devices here uh, using the structure sensor. Um, CAT scans or computer axial tomographies, uh, which work off of X-rays, positron emission tomography PET gamma rays, and then magnetic resonance imaging MRIs, and then ultrasound. And all of these can derive 3D information. So it's done through a technique called tomography, where essentially if we slice these scans, either reflecting or emitting this information to a sensor on the other side, and just taking slices, if we know where it is in X, Y state, then we can have that extra dimension. And then we can then take those by using transforms and create 3D, or they call them volume renders, which I'm going to go through in a little bit. 
First item is light emission. Uh, you may have already been familiar with some of these. The Connect, let me see what I've got, time of flight. If you're familiar with the Connect 2, uh, the Trindle LiDAR system, and then there's another company out there, Soft Kinetics, and I kind of let the cat out of the bag. Supposedly the MakerBot's new scanner that's going to be coming out, they didn't want me to tell anybody about this, is going to be using this sensor. And then you have projected pattern deformation, prime sense to connect, um, and then the structure sensor, which is what I use, where you project the pattern. Photogrammetry, if you're familiar with uh, Autodesk 123D Catch and their new product, Memento. Um, Parallax, the Fuel 3D, works off of this principle, as well as the Artec. Uh, actually, I have Fuel 3D didn't there twice. So these are all useful for creating surface models. And what is that good for? Uh, from a medical standpoint, you can record surface deformation. So if somebody has cancer or some anomaly on their skin, you can record this over time and then use differential uh, time uh, subtraction in order to see the growth or the lack of growth, whatever the case may be. Or in my case, uh, we're going to be using this to form fit clothing uh, for people who have burns. And I don't know if you've ever been burnt, but the last thing you want to be done or used is moved around. And what they're doing right now is poking and probing with measurement devices, and uh, it causes excruciating pain. So the idea is to use a scanning system and never have to touch them or move them, uh, which later on I can give a demonstration. On to uh, CAT scans. This is x-rays. Uh, a lot of people think that CAT scans over time are creating too much radiation. The newer ones actually have more or less em emissions than a dental uh, x-ray. And uh, they're using even more and more technology to minimize it even more. So they're becoming much more safe. Uh, I learned a lot of this from a radiologist from Florida that I interviewed about six months ago. The other type, which obviously is more safer, but we don't really know the long-term effects of magnetic radiation. However, if you use magnetic radiation, you can modify the spin of a hydrogen protein, a proton, and uh, this can be recorded, and you can use this to detect, as I say, the, the water movement in your body. And I'll show a little bit later how that looks. And then uh, there's a little bit more. If you're familiar with the technology, essentially you have to use some super cool magnets in order to detect this shift in the, the protons. And then there's some other technical group that I'll run by that. I'm going to have this all available as a PDF, so if you're interested in more information later on. Uh, ultrasound imaging is becoming prominent because the technology is improved. They use a 2 to 3 gigahertz ultrasound emission and they essentially reflect it into the body, and then there they can create images. If you modify the angle of that emission, you can create three-dimensional. If you've seen the, the little infants or fetuses uh, that they're, they're creating now and printing, this is the technique. In fact, I kind of cracked the code not too long ago, and I'm actually able to do this too. So it's kind of a neat direction to go. GE has kind of had it all bottled up for a while. So the big thing that all of us can have access, if you get a scan, it normally comes to you as a DICOM. So if you're wondering what that means, that means digital imaging and communications in medicine. And essentially, it is an organization that went through and said, we're going to create a standard so that way people can write software and viewers so that you can take that information that comes from a lot of different types of scanning devices and be able to read them in other software. So this was really a big breakthrough. Before then, GE, um, Philips, they all had, actually Fujitsu and Toshiba, they all had different types of scanners and you couldn't read them, so you had to have expensive software. So, and then obviously we can go through a little bit more, but I'll skip that. So what are some imaging applications? So if you've got your DICOM, they normally come with a 2D viewer. Well, if we're working in the 3D realm, which is what I'm doing, how do I get this information? Back in November of 2013, there was a, a, a medical professor, I think in uh, Malaysia, who had actually 3D printed a skull 
and then was able to use that in order to provide some training and some pre-operation processes. And I thought, wow, that's a really cool idea. At the same time, my wife was uh, diagnosed with a tumor. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to apply those same techniques? I thought, well, how am I going to do that? I don't have the money that it takes to get this software. So I started doing some research, and I came up with two different products. The first one is 3D Slicer. I call it like the Swiss tool. It's used by a lot of research people. In fact, if you open it up, it says it cannot be used for medical use. So it's mainly for research. And then Imbacilius, which is a product out of um, Brazil. And they've got a technical group called, them, called CTI down there that developed this. And they're using it in South America with physicians. Of the two, Invisilius is easier to work with. They did that because they wanted physicians to be able to review things with their patients. So they tried to make it easy, like a one, two, three process. What I'm going to be showing now is 3D Slicer because I feel that is a more robust tool for the things that I was wanting to do. So essentially, you load your DICOM. And what I did is just copy the CD they give you onto your hard drive, and then you just tell the software where it's at. And then it gives you a list of the types of scans that we're taking. In this case, we're looking at an MRI, and it tells you the different types, T1, T2, if you ever looked at them. Um, there's some meaning behind that. It essentially tells about the energy level of the MRI when the scans are being made. Then once you've loaded in, then you can bring the what they call the, uh, the volumes, which is the series of scans. Are you having a hard time hearing me, or is it OK? And uh, so essentially here on the right-hand side of the panel, we have the different frames. So if you've seen 2D images, you're probably familiar with those. Um, you have you know, the top view, the side view, and the back view, or the front view, depending on which side you want. And then you have a little box in the middle. For the most part, you never see anything in the middle until you go through a, few, excuse me, a series of steps, which I'm going to do now. One of the things that some 2D imager programs work with is that you can take those 3D or three views and then stack them. So you can kind of get a representation of 3D, but in reality, it's just three 2D faces that are aligned properly. If you are a professional and if you're a radiologist, from what I was told in some of the interviews I did with them, they think in 3D. So they don't really need this extra tool. Well, I'm not a radiologist, so I need the, as much help as I can in order to move forward. So I thought, this tool has the ability, and it's called volume rendering, of taking that information. And if you notice over here in these slides here, they're in grayscale. Well, I can use parameters to kind of bring out the information in that. And here you see a fuzzy image. That's just a grayscale information. But then I can use some tools to clean it up. So now I can see what I call a volume render or through the surface of the person. And then I can actually slice it, and if you read it, using what they call region of interest, where you can clip it. Now we can actually go inside the person. We can start probing and looking and, you know, sorry, honey. <laughs> but uh, it's almost like a cadaver, but no mess, no blood. And then we can rotate it. So in the case of my wife, I really wanted to understand what, uh, what was going on. Um, you know, we were told initially through our original neurologist that it really wasn't anything to worry about. Well, obviously, we felt it was something to worry about. So we moved on, and we got further tests done. And then I brought it into the software, and I was able to actually see it was a 3.5 centimeter tumor sitting behind the eye, which is what you can see here. It was depressing the bone, but more importantly, it was wrapped around the optic nerve. So. If you saw some of these articles that said, man saves wife's eye, no, that's kind of an exaggeration. It didn't save it. But if we had listened to the original neurologist and waited a year, yeah, she might have had some atrophy in her optic nerve. So we can also apply color. So if you want it to be even more lifelike, um, you can do so. So from there, I did a comparison last week of 
her scan done on 5-13-2014 in MRI, and then another scan done on May 1st, 2015. And you can see the difference. What they did in the surgery, and we'll have to give, I have to give a lot of credit uh, to Dr. Gardner, uh, who is her neurosurgeon in uh, Pittsburgh. Now we live in Morro Bay, we're in a small community. We don't have those type of experts. So the first thing is make sure you broaden your, your level of experience and go outside of your local community, if you're in a small community. Obviously you're in Stanford, you've got a lot of expertise here. Um, but we went to University of Pittsburgh because they used a unique technique where they drilled through her eye, you know, the tumor. So essentially what normally gets done is you cut a hole in the person's skull, move the brain, which has its own issues, and then get at the tumor. Here they went in the other direction. So what's left now, and it's kind of hard to see in this one in the comparison, is there is no bone, but there is scar tissue. And I think I might. So I may have another image later on uh, that I can send a link to. But here we've gone from renders, which are on the computer. Well, how do we get these kind of models here? Well, the problem is to create a 3D model, you essentially have information that is on, <coughs> plastic, or off, no plastic. But if you notice, the images are all grayscale. But if you look at this, I've highlighted just the white area. So with MRIs, it's very, very difficult to create models because there's just a lot of grayscale. So you have to create a high contrast, and then you have to set parameters to say, where do I want material and where I don't want material. So there's a lot of work in MRI. CTs are a little easier because bone shows up pretty quickly, and you can tell where bone is and where bone isn't. So in these cases, these were CTs, and it was very easy to create those. How much time do I have? I'm done? Okay. I'm almost done here. Okay, so here's another version of it, well, some newer information. But you can see a depression in the brain here from the tumor. And then there are tools in here that you can smooth it. If you notice, the other models were kind of blocky. And then eventually you can have your wife's brain in your hand. <laughs> she hates it. <laughs> so here, I've now brought them into my 3D program, and I can clean them up further, and then I can print them just like I did there. So fabrication, you have um, 3D printers, bio printers, which we're going to hear about in just a moment, standard printers, we have SLA printers, if you're familiar with 3D printing, I probably don't need to go through that. And um, so we have the organic and bio, and then a new thing that's coming out a lot of people is pharmaceuticals. Using the same process, you put a whole bunch of chem or chemicals in different bins, and you use extruders in order to create a certain medical compound. And this is going to be very useful in areas where you don't have access to a lot of medications. So you could put one of these plants in. So as I said, uh, I really think I'm living in a time where we're going to see that singularity and uh, I've enjoyed talking to a lot of smart people in the 3D industry in a lot of different uh, walks of life. And then finally, <laughs> I was, I said, man, I'm going to cry. <laughs> but I dedicate this to my wife. So now we welcome Danny Cabrera, joining us from Philadelphia. He's the co-founder of BioBots. Danny is a biohacker turned entrepreneur. He began working on the next generation of biofabrication tools after achieving the first place in the iGen competition for his work on new epigenetic engineering tools. Cool. Um, 
thanks so much for coming out, and thanks so much to the MedEx makers, uh, organizers, thanks you guys for putting this together and for bringing me out here. And really excited to be part of this panel. I mean, awesome, awesome talks from all the other experts, and it's just great to be out here. We're going to figure out the best places to stay. Um, very cool. So like you guys heard, I'm, I'm Danny. I'm one of the founders of, of BioBots. And I'm going to walk you guys basically through um, our story. Is there a quick here? Yeah, I'm going to walk you guys a little bit through our story, what we're working on, and why we're excited about it, and why this is relevant to, to you guys. So just quickly before I keep going, um, can I just get a brief survey? Um, who here is like in academia? Can you guys raise your hands? Cool. And then who is like industry? All right. And then I guess like whatever's left is government or something. <laughs> there we go. Medicine. Awesome. Medicine. Medicine. Okay, cool. There we go. Medicine. Great. Okay, cool. So uh, I want you guys to, I mean, this is usually how I start off. It's just um, like the promise of, of bioprinting. And I want you guys to just imagine for one second a future where patients with organ failures are able to receive customer placements built on, on bioprinters out of their own cells. Um, I mean, just imagine like the kind of change that, or the kind of uh, impact that can have on, on medicine and on the world in general. Now, although it seems a little bit far off, a little bit far away, these products and these, uh, these therapies are actually starting to happen. Um, some researchers on the cutting edge are actually already printing and implanting simple, simple tissues, simple organs, things like skin, tracheas, and even bladders. Um, and and beyond, beyond implantable organs, really, the, the biotech industry is beginning to take advantage of this technology to um, replace cumbersome animal testing with uh, 3D bioprinted miniature organs built out of human cells. So the idea is you can actually use these miniature organs to, to test new compounds, new biologics, and uh, begin to personalize medicines. And uh, this, is, this is part of what is getting us really excited about the field. Um, however, like the first generation tools, the first generation 3D bioprinters, have shown us the promise of, of what's possible, but today we feel that they're holding back the revolution. And I want you guys to just, I mean, I'm sure some of you guys can remember, but I want you guys, to, for those of you who are younger like me, um, think back to dawn of computing. You might have seen pictures like this of uh, giant mainframe computers. This is actually uh, ENIAC, uh, I'm, I'm a Penn grad, so we have a good history with ENIAC, and we have like a old version of it in the engineering quad. And I mean, so these, these were giant mainframe computers that cost like millions of dollars, took up entire rooms, like probably bigger than this auditorium, and were operated by punch cards and teams of, of technicians. And basically what, what we're arguing here is that biology today is, isn't much different. Um, State-of-the-art biofabrication tools aren't very different than this. Um, they're basically take up entire rooms, like I mean, existing bioprinters, you basically need an entire like facility to, to operate them and, and use them. And they're operate, they cost upwards of like half a million dollars, and you need teams of really specially trained technicians to be able to use these devices. And um, I mean, yeah, that's, uh, that's sort of the state of the art of the field. And this is, this is where we come from. Um, our, other, our founder, Ricardo, who's not here today, he, he actually worked with those devices. He spent a lot of time um, working in this space. And he really learned all of the deep, dark secrets of, of what works and what doesn't work with the technology, and started putting together a next generation version in his dorm room while he was at Penn. And that's where that's when he brought me on. I um, I studied computer science and, and biology, and uh, like a, sort of what was having the in my bio, um, I like worked on tools for genetic engineering with a very like computer science twist. So I ended up writing a lot of the first uh, first like versions of our software. And together we built something that, that is pretty incredible. It's the it's the first desktop 3D bioprinter, and uh, we're calling it the Biobot. And you can see it right here. I, um, I will walk you guys through how it works in just a second. But it's basically um, it's the first product of its kind. It's the first device that actually fits on your desk and uh, allows you to do bioprinting. Um, and there are really two key innovations here. Um, the first is that uh, we like took something that we took something that used to like fill up an entire room and shrunk it to something that fits in your desk. But really, the key innovation is that we developed a new process to to build 3D living tissues. And I mean, what what I mean? Uh, Existing devices that do 3D printing, like all these plastic devices um, uh, that, that we've been hearing about, and even most uh, bioprinters, they use harsh processes, things like UV radiation and heat to cure materials. And that obviously doesn't work so well when you've got cells in your solutions because cells die when you cook them up and they die when you shine UV radiation on them, right? Like that's where you put sunblock on when you go outside in the sun. Um, 
And uh, we realized that this was a problem. So what we did was we actually just uh, like worked on new chemistries that allow us to use visible light to cure tissues. So basically, uh, you, we shine light on a solution of material that has cells inside. We create free radicals that then interact with uh, larger polymers and crosslink without killing the cells in the solution. And um, I mean, so this, I think, I'm not sure what, this, what deck this is, but I think this is like a deck where I was unveiling our first kit. So I think I'm gonna do that now. Uh, <laughs> so we actually, we like package all of this stuff. I mean, we've been shipping these devices for, for a few months and we've been working with, uh, closely with academic researchers to really figure out, um, you know, what, how, do we, how do we make this experience easier for people who don't have the material science expertise? I mean, I know a lot of you guys here in medicine, I don't know how much research you guys, like any of, are you guys like, if you guys are more on the clinical side or more on the research side, but I mean, basically, unless you're a biomaterials expert, you can't use this technology without knowing, I mean, without like having some sort of kit or inks that you can just put into this thing. And so that's what we set out to build. And um, we actually released this last week. We're uh, starting to beta test it now with some clients. And it's basically, it has everything you need to start bioprinting. It, um, it has a syringe, some uh, gauges, a plate, a dish to put on your device. And the key thing here is this like solution that we've developed. And it's basically a mixture of a special collagen that we modified to work with this visible light initiator, and you can reliably mix um, cells in this thing. Uh, so we, we can mix different types of MCs and build basically 3D cartilage tissue without having the biomaterials expertise. So it's our way of democratizing technology and really making it more accessible to not just researchers who want to build this stuff in a reliable, robust manner, but actually people who wouldn't normally be able to use the technology. And um, so how, how does it all work? And it sounds a little bit like magic, so I'm gonna walk you guys through a use case. Um, I would have a sample to show you guys, but as I was, as we were shipping this, uh, we were as brought on the plane, and TSA actually searched through the box and they found our uh, our sample, and I guess they, they said that wasn't cool. So, <laughs> so I'm just uh, you won't you won't see the final print, um, but you can imagine it. <laughs> um, all right, so here we go. Um, we're big fans of Van Gogh, so we did, this is like a fun demo that we do for cartilage. Uh, uh, so we, uh, we designed his, his ear, um, we're big fans of him, and felt like who needs a bit ear more than Van Gogh. Um, so basically we just designed this thing using like traditional CAD software that you, that you guys are, I don't know who's familiar with, but I mean like SolidWorks or in this case we use all the best software. Um, we then import this file into our software platform, which is just like basically piggybacked off of open source um, stuff and retrofit to work with our device. Um, that, our, that our software then converts the design into from a file into printer instructions. So basically tells the device like how to move and how to build the thing. And the way the device works, I mean, as you can see, it has like a lot of features of traditional 3D printers. So it's a three-axis system, the way that like most of these FDM printers are. So it moves an X, this thing moves this way, and this, the bed moves down. And um, yeah, so you control the extrusion of material with this regulator, this thing that actually usually hooks up to an air compressor or like a source of compressed air, and that's why we can't do a demo here because I didn't bring one. It's just like a lot of stuff to carry around for a person. Um, and so that feeds it into the syringe, uh, which usually contains your solution material. So in the case for cartilage, like you just take it out of the kit, mix in, mix in your cells into that vial, and put it into the syringe and just load it into this. Um, so and then we've got like you know we've uh, tuned the pressure so we know like if you're printing at 150 micron resolution you print at 60 psi and um, so all the calibration is done all the calibration is done for you and all you need to do is press print on the software load this thing up and it'll print the ear um, so I mean ideally like this is the time where I would like pull out the ear and show you guys but sorry <laughs> not gonna happen um, yeah so I, that's like that pretty much sums most most of the tech up um, just gonna sort of wrap oh there it is. Cool. <laughs> so that's what it would look like um, if, we had, if we had printed it. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> so I mean, what, what we're doing with this technology is um, we, I mean, we started off with cartilage. It was like a pretty easy place to start because a lot of our initial adapters and collaborators are working on cartilage. So we knew sort of where to take the technology. But it's key to note that the chemistries are very modular, and we can actually build multiple different tissue types. You have people working. I mean, if you can think of a tissue, somebody's using our device to work on that tissue. And we're we're pushing these devices into beginning to push these devices into into pharma, where they can be used to. I mean, like I said earlier, basically to augment uh, preclinical drug development. And I mean, you can only imagine like the kind of future we can create here, um, from one drug developed for millions of people in these long and expensive clinical trials, to drugs that are really personalized, uh, built for individuals using 3D bioprinted tissues, um, built out of patients' own cells. And I mean, pharma has been getting very excited about this, and so have we. <laughs> 
Um, and uh, I mean, this here's just like a brief list. That we started like shipping these devices in January. This is like our, these are some of our beta clients. You can see Stanford's one of them. We have a uh, where is she? Is she here? <laughs> so uh, Stanford's Horn is one of our early clients also. And um, yeah, I mean, we're just really excited to be working with so many great people at so many great institutions. And we, this work really wouldn't be possible without them. Um, so our devices are currently available for like basically beta testing or playing with. They start at five thousand dollars. It's um, we like give you like a year of service, like full maintenance fee, like cover everything. If anything breaks, if you want to ship it back, it doesn't matter. Um, but the key is that we tap into our community of these awesome researchers and sort of uh, begin these collaborations. This is a this is a really big problem that we're tackling, and we know that we can't do it alone. And we also, I mean, and our collaborators know that they can't do it alone. So having people working together in this space is very important. That's um, that's really what we're fostering here. And the cartilage kit is starting at 3,000. I mean, it's sort of like um, just like a beta sample people can start playing with. We're still getting some data on it. Happy to share that with you guys if you guys are interested. Um, that basically sums it up. I, uh, I think we're moving to Q&A now. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. So happy to get that going. So if I know all the presenters join the up front here. So as we get ready for the question and answer section of the program, uh, I have the mic for the person capable of questions, so raise your hand and I'll run to you with the microphone. So as we're getting set up, do we have anyone who wants to start things off with a question? Okay, Sheila, I'll be right there. Monica, are we ready for a question? Yeah, we can take okay. a question. Yes. Uh -huh. You're nervous about asking a question in such an august group of scientists. It's a question for Danny. Uh, where, do you, where do you envision obtaining the raw material to produce things on a large scale, for example, cartilage? Or are you going to take it from people? Or are you going to take it from animals or manufacture it uh, in a lab? Or how exactly? Yeah, I mean the I mean the cell the cell piece is important here because these constructs require lots of cells. And um, you're right. I mean, uh, how do how do you get so many cells? Um, one one way to do it is to grow them from patients. However, I mean, there's new technologies that are coming into play that really allow it to happen. And we're partnering off with companies that that specialize in cell manufacturing, and that's how we're thinking about tackling the problem. Is that something that? that we specialize in, so we, I really don't have a great answer for you, other than we are working with people who know it better than we do. Questions from the audience? Can you maybe just tell us your name and, and, uh, and where you're from? Okay. Uh, my name's Kate Stevenson. I'm home right now at Stanford University. I'm a PhD in chemical engineering here. I have a question for um, on the uh, prosthetics. Uh, looks like you guys are looking at advancing from uh, a very decorative element, so you have a standardized leg design uh, with a lot of customizability in the fairing, and moving more into orthotics and other products that involve a lot of customized analysis in addition to just customized design. And that is actually a very expensive thing to add into your business model. I was wondering how you guys are looking to do that. Yeah, I mean, um uh, the orthotic industry is um, pretty known for having uh, something that we call custom fabrication, where you actually work with uh, pretty uh, experienced uh, orthotists on the other side um, in terms of uh, optimizing these uh, the casts and uh, whatever needs to be done in that process. So we will definitely have to add uh, more clinical expertise uh, into this, uh, because it's uh, to work at distance like we do now, uh, with uh, obviously prosthetists on the other end, um, we need to team up on our end with the same type of expertise to be able to kind of communicate uh, back and forth. Um, in the beginning, with this scoliosis brace that we're doing, we are actually uh, taking uh, casts uh, in, uh, the orthotist takes a cast and he, he, we, we sent that uh, kind of test cast over to us and uh, we scan that. So that's the way we do deal with it now. 
Uh, that's a little bit cumbersome process that we want to get out of, so we can just uh, do this once and not time to do it twice. So uh, yeah, there will be some workarounds in the beginning for sure because you're right. I mean, we started with. It's so important when you start on a journal like this, you have to start in the most easiest way as possible, and the pairings were fantastic as a way to start because it's not even a medical device; it's a medical device accessory, and so you got also out of the regulations and. But still reimbursed with the cameras. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm Joe. I'm from uh, the, the neighborhood. Um, <laughs> so, uh, probably a question for Biobot. Anyone wants to chime in? Um, we, we recently had a bunch of sort of uh, patent issues with 3D printing. Um, in terms of extrusion processes and materials that we could use, and those patents have expired. And we also had patent issues around genes for testing, you know, for breast cancer and things like this. I'm wondering um, if anyone is afraid or talking to people. It would be really weird if I could have the capacity to 3D print an ear, but <clears throat> for patent issue reasons, I. Um, I would be arrested for having said ear. I mean, I can download a movie, not that I do this, but if you want to download the latest episode of Game of Thrones illegally, you can. And I'm wondering, how does that change when you push these things into our bodies? Um, and, and how do you guys feel about those things? I mean, the medical industry is pretty regulated, and I think it's not, I don't think those regulations are going away. I mean, sometimes they hinder progress, but in general, they're, they're there to protect um, to protect the patients. I think, um, yeah, this technology is definitely going to push those, and it's definitely, it's already starting to. And those questions like this are very important, and they're ethical things that we think about. However, realistically, this technology just isn't there yet. I mean, this is still like a preclinical tool um, used for research purposes. Um, so I really want to make that clear. I was, I mean, when I, I talk about things that, that I think about in the future, uh, it's just like uh, musings. And uh, I think this technology is enabling that, but um, yeah, I think those, those are important questions that, that we deal with as we as the technology matures. I don't know. I'm sure other people should chime in comments here. <laughs> I have a follow-up question for that. Okay. Uh, my name's Linda Glenn. I'm a bioethicist in the neighborhood. And uh, my question is for all of you, but it was Ethor's uh, presentation that made me think a little bit more about this. The boundaries between persons and property. <clears throat> uh, Ethor, in your presentation, a lot of your, a lot of the patients using the set, they felt like this was an extension of themselves. <clears throat> do you really, how do you feel about that? And do you think that the law may change or that ethics may dictate and this is the question is directed to you, but also to the other two. Do you think that things may change that those things might be recognized as extensions of individuals rather than property or things that can be patented? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting when you say that because you've obviously gone from uh, back in you know hundreds years hundred years ago. Um, these things were pretty much an extension of yourself. If you go and you look at work, like I showed a little bit here from, from Switzerland, for instance, they were really good at working out these wooden legs and it was beautiful artifacts that probably in collaboration with the users were created as an extension of themselves. And then you kind of go through this kind of modern era where we have to crack this out uh, uh, fast and furiously uh, during World War II and so on, and we, we go towards standardized uh, in industrialization, and now we're coming back to this. Um, so, yeah, whether that is um, uh, an issue or not, uh, it's probably a little bit too, too early, early to say. Um, I think uh, right now we are just dealing with that. I think people are just kind of flattered, first of all, that they actually are being asked, and now you have a choice. <laughs> So we're kind of first dealing with that. I think people are kind of overwhelmed even uh, by the fact that they have a choice, and that can be an issue in itself. So your issue is probably coming a little bit down later. <laughs> After the singularity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
then we won't need to worry about our bodies anymore. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to point out something. I'm wearing glasses. And yes, glasses are copyrighted. Certain techniques are patented, but we still seem to be able to make them our own. So I think there will be some regulation there. The other thing is when we're talking about bioprinting, Will I Am had said something in the news two months ago and how we should regulate it because he doesn't want somebody like him running around. So that was kind of funny. I brought that up myself. myself. <laughs> So maybe if I could direct the conversation, we're talking about the boundary between uh, products and our personal selves, but I really want to move the conversation about uh, how, how that is in collaboration, how those boundaries are breaking down. I think all three presentations really talked about democratization of, of this technology allowing their various processes or um, topics to be accessed by the general public. I think specifically I had a question for Michael, if he could expand a little bit on his process and how how that went about in terms of gathering this data and then sending it out and what. How did you, contacting the surgeons, what was what was the response? How many were willing to look at, at your knowledge and, and, and how did you move forward? Do I have another 12 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually my better half who's not here a big part in that. She's been very diligent in doing a lot of research. You know, the internet is very, very useful to us, and I just can't imagine what we would be like without it. Actually, I'm old enough to realize that <laughs> I've forgotten it. <laughs> Blocking it, maybe. But essentially, she spent a lot of time. Uh, the year before that, she had her thyroid removed, and we decided how can we get it removed without the excessive scar that could possibly cut nerves and maybe even lose her voice. So we wanted to look at something that was less invasive, uh, recovery time was faster. So again, we went to UPMC because they were using the Da Vinci robotic system. So before you go, oh, there's been some scare, but there's some reasons for that. But under an expert hand, which our surgeon there was, he was able to remove it through her armpit. And without any after effects from it. So we thought, in my mind, we're going back there for anything else, which is what we did. But she wanted to research it. Okay, we have a tumor, how do we get rid of it? What kind of tumor? These are all the questions that even her local physicians were not able to answer because they didn't have the expertise. And we even actually went to Stanford and to UCLA to get expert opinion, and they pretty much said, you're gonna to have to get a craniotomy. She didn't want to do that, one, because they'd have to shave her hair, but uh, more importantly, they would have to move the brain. And when you have to traction the brain, that can cause some serious issues. So she didn't want to go in that direction. So she kept saying, well, is there any other alternatives? So then she found out that some tumors are being removed through the sinuses. So in her case, well, obviously it's a little longer to go through the sinuses, then they found out that UPMC as well as um, can't think of the name now. There's one other location was doing it through the eye. But the important thing, you're asking about teamwork. This was not just by, done by one year, sir. You actually had to have an expert ophthalmologist surgeon involved too because you have to understand the eye because you're going through that. So they actually removed part of the bone in her eyebrow and had to move the, the muscles surrounding the eye. So it was a team effort. And this is becoming more prominent in the medical community that you're getting these experts together from what I've was told by Dr. Gardner, this is unheard of. You get these experts, and it's really difficult for them to work together. But they work very, very well. Her surgery took eight hours with a little Dremel tool. I can't work more than 15 minutes with a Dremel tool before my back gets sore. So not only were they dedicated and had the expertise, but they worked very hard to ensure that most of it was removed. She still has 5% of the tumor there, but it's around the optic nerve, and they felt that that wasn't the risk they wanted to take. We agree, and now we're monitoring it. I didn't get a chance to mention it. It's been one year today since the operation. For the most part, she's completely good. She has headaches, pretty severe ones at time. We really can't pin it down. For, but other than that, the quality of life, just three weeks later, she was back to work. That's unheard of normally with craniology. So it was very good. To, but again, you have to go out there. There's tons of information, not only one through Google, but there's a lot of other research sites that you can sign up for. Sometimes they're paid, sometimes you just have to sign up for them. But there's plenty of locations. So that's the first one. 
complex. My perspective, since I was doing 3D already, well, how can I get the tools? Well, it's the same thing. There's a lot of people out there. You can look at them on Google. Uh, like I said, Steve Piper does the, the application slicer. He's on the East Coast. We talked at length, had an interview with him. Uh, he's behind an open source program, and we talked about using open source slicer application for your 3D printer. So just get involved in the community with these people and uh, just work with them, uh, not just in our own country. As mentioned, I talked to Jorge from Brazil, who's the, the head of CT, the director of CT, is their technology division, who came up with their version of this software, and uh, which is the one that I first used. So there are plenty of places. Australia seems to be a bed set for a lot of stuff that's coming out. And all the barriers are not there anymore. I mean, just like we're doing now, I'm streaming, and who knows where this is going out to. Same thing with my podcast. I talked to people from China as though they were sitting next to us. We really live in amazing times. So did that answer the question? That was about six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Closer. It's a uh, question for you. Oh, why you? Oh, Can you tell Thank us you. Uh, your name and where you're from? Sure. Uh, my name is Parvinder. I'm from the neighborhood. <laughs> uh, so you showed us how the pricing, the price has been coming down on these uh, what look like beautiful prosthetics. So uh, and currently it's mostly the more the Western markets that I see, uh, at least from your map. What would it take to get it down another order of magnitude so that um, it's more broadly uh, used in other parts of the world? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we all live stream, so I'd be careful of being in yourself some today. Um, <laughs> I know the great thing about 3D printing is that um, just in that year since we launched uh, this website, uh, prices have come down on our products about 50 percent. And uh, uh, versus we spoke, those prices were up in like four to six thousand. Now we are at between 500 and a thousand dollars. And uh, and I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, we live in exponential times that. In just one another one year, we will have other pairings that, that whether it's ours uh, from us or somebody else, that will be at least uh, half as uh, less expensive as we currently have. And um, and it's a combination of many things. I mean, it's we talk about collaboration. We collaborate a lot with designers uh, that are in Europe, for instance. We don't employ designers here; they're too expensive. Um, and then uh, we obviously the, the printers we use are, are different than, for instance, the 3D systems used. Uh, they use the SLS technology. Uh, we are using uh, more the, the, the cheaper, almost hobby printers, uh, and they work, and we are stretching them as we can, for sure, but it works. So it's a combination of technology, uh, how we outsource, uh, how, how that formula comes together. And currently, like I said, it, uh, it's done in four to six weeks before people have to travel into San Francisco uh, to get measured and all of that. So uh, we are used, utilizing, like I said, one to read the cats, uh, Memento as well, uh, to uh, optimize that process and just using uh, smartphones and instead of scanners. So it's also cheaper for the clinicians. So I think it's just about being uh, really, continuing to be resourceful. And what's been great, uh, especially in Spain, where you have a high unemployment rate, people become very resourceful. And uh, and that's been a huge driver behind uh, innovating on the cost side. So, um, <coughs> oh, sorry. 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 I'd like to add to that really quick. There's a, what would you call it, an open source community called Enable that's run by John Shure that I interviewed, oh gosh, almost a year ago. Fantastic program. A lot of people like myself, um, personal fabricators, designers are going through and creating prosthetics, robotic type things for children, uh, which is really important because as they're growing, it can be very expensive. But because, again, we can thank the internet, 
we have people around the world with 3D printers printing in areas where they could never afford something like that. So I would look into that if you're looking for yourself personally. But yeah, great group. And um, there's obviously some talent there as well. And that's my question to you. Are you working with them as well? Or? Yeah, I mean, we are talking a lot together. They work quite a bit with 3D systems as well. So uh, uh, I get on the advisory board soon. So this is a small, small world. Uh, you can't escape each other. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Not anymore. So, uh, looking at the time, we're just about out of time. Maybe one last question. Um, and while we figure out who that person is going to be, I'll ask the question. Uh, for the people in this room who uh, are interested in learning more about 3D printing, uh, any I'd like to hear from, from each of you. Um, how might someone get started in learning more about this? Um, and Or how did you know, what would you recommend to people who are interested in learning more about 3D printing and trying to figure out how it might apply for their interests? Yeah, I mean, uh, talk so much about uh, the internet here and uh, things being available. I think when it comes to 3D printing, there is, uh, I think that obviously is the, the number one uh, re resource. And uh, the MakerBot movement uh, is just this weekend. There's a big pair going on, and uh, so it's actually unusually easy, I think, to get uh, involved with with 3D printing uh, versus many other technologies. So, um, but I'm sure through your podcast you have. From additional good ideas. I was going to say, wow, thanks. The question was for me. <laughs> All things 3D. <laughs> There, there's plenty of things. There are other podcasts. Actually, there's not that many of them out there. But there's other. Uh, there's 3dears.org. They talk about it. Uh, what is the other one? 3D print industry. So there's a ton of different locations that you can go out to to get information. There's a lot of forums. So if you want to get to the nitty gritty, people like myself make comments. Um, obviously, there's probably a forum that you've worked off of. Um, one of my friends who also developed a SLS, SLS, SLA printer called the Middle RP down in Santa Barbara. Um, he's in the forums. There's a lot of experts there. So all you have to do is find them and look for them. And if you want a location, come to me first, because I always put all the links to all of my shows so that you can find all the resources. So if you don't want to hear me, just go to my show notes. So <laughs> I still have the same information. Save yourself an hour and a half. I'm going to go a little bit different route here. I. I, mean, I like to touch things and like build things by hand. So I would really suggest finding like a community of people locally that have the expertise and are working on cool projects. I think, at least for me, like projects and like things with goals are like the way that I get excited about things and really learn about them. And I know that uh, I mean, if, like everywhere, there's a maker community at this point. Um, I, I here, there's definitely a huge maker community, and if, I mean, it's easy enough to tap into. Um, just, Right, like Google, where the maker community is and where, where the spaces are. And usually, the, I mean, I know you're working on a, on a maker space here in, in Sanford, and I think that that's like those sorts of spaces where there's the tools and there's the expertise and people who know the things and can really direct you um, in your learning and guide you in making progress in your projects. That's how we got started on, on bioprinting. I think that's how a lot of the like new printers are getting started. A lot of the, like even these open source projects, most of them are started in maker spaces. Um, and it's just like there's something about physically being somewhere with people working on things, like talking about it all the time and like breathing it, sleeping on it, and like that I think is what fosters innovation and it's a, it's a really good way to get started. Okay, our last question for the night. I actually have um, uh, David Stewart. I work here at Stanford on the clinical side. Um, I actually have two questions. The first one's for Danny. Um, I did, you didn't mention, and I didn't see on your website, the price point, and I wanted to know whatever the price point is, how soon before you go from whatever it is to similar to the $6,000 to under a half K similarly? Um, and then my second question is for everybody. I noticed that um, nobody had mentioned in their uh, people that they're working with um, any military organizations and having spent more than two decades in military medicine um, I've seen a very big difference between the care that we provided during the first Gulf War coming up to most recently where do you guys see your technology going um, in that space okay so the first out question. of the research side into actual practical application yeah so um, first question I guess was around pricing 
So we were starting these off at, at 5K for like collaborators, and um, I sort of walked through it quickly. Um, as far as where the price will go and like how quickly it'll be going down and to where it'll go, I really don't have the answer. I mean, um, we're working on like not just bringing the price down, but actually like innovating on the technology. I mean, like printing printing tissues is still like that fully figured out, and the tools that that do that are still evolving. So rather than focusing so much on bringing the price down um, right now, our focus is to deliver the best technology experience uh, possible. And and that the reason for that is because I mean, we we don't I mean although we were like huge fans of like the you know maker movement and like people making with biology and like engineering things in, at home and like biology at home, it's it's like pretty niche and I don't think it's um it's not ready for like serious uh, tissue engineering just yet. Um, maybe it'll get there at some point, and I hope it does. And at that point, I think the price points will, like, dropping the price point is going to be more important. But right now, it's definitely just about technology and making sure that, that we deliver um, the best technology possible. Now, as far as uh, type of applications, um, and by that I'm guessing clinical um, is, what, is what you mean. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually closer than you think. I mean, these devices are, are being used in a lot of, uh, like, they're pushing animal studies right now, and um, uh, I mean, as far as like when clinical trials will start for like things, I, I don't, I don't have, I don't have the dates, and I can't like, you know, I don't, I don't know when that'll happen. But definitely in the next few years, for the simple things like skin and cartilage and, and even bone um, that are coming out of our devices, um, and, and and this is going to come first in less regulated parts of the world. Um, I mean, realistically, like the United States uh, regulatory landscape is is a hurdle um, for if if that's like if that's your as as a, as a business right if that's the place you're going after it just takes serious capital to to go through that process and um, unless we're in parts of the world that's not really the case and we're happy that that we're allowing people in those parts of the world to, to innovate at that level and to to push technology into into the planet. So you were talking specifically about the military perspective. So I'm a veteran of the first Gulf War. So, from my experience in talking with some people, probably more from the mechanical, but I'll let him talk from the prosthetics, because I think some of the, the people you had in the slides were from the Gulf War recently. So, he probably has more experience from that perspective. But there seems to be a lot of interest to have 3D printers on site so they can fabricate parts when things break down. Now, from a biomedical standpoint, I don't have any experience there. Yeah, I mean, um, in my previous companies, uh, like Bolster, we were the biggest supplier of prosthetic gear to, to the military, and uh, and so there's uh, amazing to see the development there and from people being very frustrated with uh, the services that the military people got to, to now getting absolutely the best. Uh, in terms of uh, specifically 3D printing, I mean, obviously these these fairings that are already being ordered by by VA and and, and so on. That's obvious. Uh, but I see maybe these things uh, go where uh, the military and uh, will, will definitely be on the forefront and already is, is uh, especially in terms of the capturing of the data, uh, making sure that I mean, it's not already with the exoskeletons and and so on that they're also being fitted onto. Uh, the military folks uh, to help to really carry things as much as possible on, on, on the back. Uh, obviously, comfort is so important, and the shoe wear and so on. And so, to have good uh, data and, and, and in a scanned format uh, on a regular basis uh, from from military people, and uh, basically have that on 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 your you know store, so that uh, when something happens. But it is you have to fit something onto you on a regular basis, or there are injuries and so on, and you can easily uh, 3D print things and, and 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 do things so so that people can whether it is uh, braces or, or prosthetic legs or even something that's more uh, by nature uh, in, in the future can be just uh, applied. So I think this kind of constant measuring and scanning of the of of the body uh, is definitely going to be a high attention and and early market uh, within the military that then gets translated into uh, the civilian uh, part of the world. Okay, please give a hand to Monica Wittig, our colleague. Uh, thank you for joining us. 
Um, so this is another night. If you have more questions that we didn't have a chance to answer, if you want to come down and touch some of these things and see how they work, uh, we have a few minutes now for you to come down and interact with our panelists, ask uh, them questions. And uh, remember, uh, please share your comments about tonight's event uh, with us on our meetup page. Let us know um, what you liked, what we could do better, and give us some ideas for what you want to hear about in the future. Um, and Monica, any last words? Uh, again, so we, we indoctrinate you into this being your home as well. So we want to continue to keep in touch and have you build this with us. So thank you for coming out tonight. And don't forget Maker Fair this weekend. It's in Santa Clara, right? Santa Mateo. Santa Mateo, I'm sorry. Santa Mateo, tell them more. It's in San Mateo. You can find us in Zone 2. We'll have a booth. And for those that are asking about Enable, they'll be our direct neighbors. Uh, they're also joining us for a demo at our station, so come check us out, Zone 2. All right, thank you, everyone. Good night. Yeah, we have. <laughs>